Now entering Nerdist.com. Hello there and welcome to Today We Learned. Congratulations, guys. This is the best decision you're going to make all week. Unless, of course, you decided to also order a coffee milkshake beforehand, in which case, great planning ahead. I like the cut of your jib. I don't know a lot about sailing, but I know jibs are cut in a certain fashion, and I like how they cut yours. Now, guys, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your opinion of me, this is the last time you're going to hear my voice this episode. I know. It's sad. I wasn't kidnapped by Chechen rebels, though. No cause for alarm. Rather, I was at South by Southwest when this episode was recorded. But we know how much you need someone named Dan in your life and in your ears, so thankfully Razzle recruited the wonderful Dan Van Kirk. Now, if you don't know Dan Van Kirk, first of all, what's your problem? Are you kidding me? you got to get into this guy. You may have heard him on Sklarbro Country. You may have heard him on Doug Loves Movies as Mark Wahlberg. You may have heard him doing stand-up or performing at UCB in Los Angeles. Anyway, you got to get into this guy because he's wonderful. And uh, i got to say, from one Dan to another, he's up there. He's one of the best Dans I've ever met, so get excited. And you know what else you should be excited about? Today's guest. You know this guy from all over the place. From Lost, The Tomorrow People, Supernatural. He is a staple of genre television, and now he's going to be a staple of this podcast, at least for this episode. Hopefully we'll have him back at some point, because he sounds like a rad guy. And honestly, I'm pretty bummed I didn't get to meet him. So, without further ado, let's light this candle, shall we? Today we learned number 80 with Mark Pellegrino. Gentlemen, let's broaden our minds. I haven't I haven't seen the whole series yet. I've seen snippets <laughs> really? of the like third one, yeah. oh. where he first revealed himself with his microphone on, and the yeah. lawyer comes up and says, "Your mic's on." I don't I don't know a hundred percent of the truth. I I knowingly said what I knew. He's like <laughs> coaching. I him. knowingly, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he's talking to me. I, the whole truth. It's like, he's like I all third person, right? And he like interrogates himself almost, like oh, all yes. the time. Yeah, like, he was going over his his like, his spiel. Yeah, he was just practicing his spiel to himself. I was complicit in the disappearance of my wife in the terms that I fought with her. <laughs> you just like, That's it. What is what is going on? I gotta watch all of these because I've only seen snippets too. Are you? Oh yeah, you guys. I've only seen snippets and everything I read. Now like, that he's been arrested, yeah, it's time. Yeah, and it's not a huge commitment. It's only six episodes, and the last episode was like a half hour. Right, and, and how did he get off in Galveston with? Because yeah, they couldn't. It was crazy, right? Like no, they, they couldn't prove that it wasn't self-defense. Right, and the cutting up the body and all that. <laughs> because of, in Texas. <laughs> If yeah. someone's on your property or in your <laughs> yeah. house, this is what they say in the documentary. You can literally do anything to that person. What? That, that makes is no. That, that makes they no are, sense. They broke whatsoever. into your house. <laughs> I mean, that's what they're the, the story from him. And there's nobody to contradict this. Is that yeah, he but... walked into his house and there was Morris Black was in there with a gun. And at that point, you have the right yeah. to do whatever you want. And it, the burden is on the prosecution to prove <laughs> that it wasn't self defense. Because they don't, yeah, the, and the, and nobody in Texas, no 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 legislature, let us, legislator ever said there's a slippery slope here that we should mm, be yeah, aware of. You would think, yeah. Well, because he was still concerned for his well being after he cut the first arm off, uh, then the second, like because it was all, he was completely dismembered, right? He told me Apparently. if he ever died, he wanted to be put in the ocean piece <laughs> by piece. <laughs> I lost the letter that he wrote. <laughs> Telling me to do that now is this just coming out of your? Uh, this, you're just making this up. Okay, <laughs> I was going to say <laughs> this, is, this is crazy enough that that probably actually did. I happen. was honoring my friend, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> Speaking of honoring friends, <laughs> <laughs> we got a great show. Uh, what a what a great intro there. There's uh, some behind the scenes footage of the Jinx. <laughs> Uh, we got Crazy. we got the lost tapes of the jinx here uh, today. We learn uh, we always you know we like to be ahead of the curve um, and release those after the curve. <laughs> yeah, we're always, a, we're always a few weeks late here. It seems um, like they're always finding more audio of that guy talking. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and we're gonna. I think we some, have some lost archives here that we'll you know <laughs> refer to everyone. I love it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, those voices you hear uh, filling in for Dan Casey is a very very funny friend of mine, Dan Van Kirk. Hey, uh, say hello. Uh, then. Um, 
You already said hello. Uh, and our guest today is a very, very talented actor. Um, you've seen him in all sorts of things. You've seen him in Lost. You've seen him in CSI Dexter, Miami. Dexter, man. Dexter. Dexter. Loved your turn in Dexter. You've Thank seen him you. in Death Wish 4. I'm going all the way back there. Oh, my God. Uh, Doogie Howser, MD, even even further. Oh, my God. Uh, you've <laughs> seen him in Lost. He's got a great show on A&E that uh, just came out a couple weeks ago, I yeah. believe, right? Called The, the Returned, mm-hmm. which sounds like it's... I'm, I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but it sounds like it's right up my alley. Yes. Um, so I'm going to check that out. So everybody watch that, too. Uh, but listen to this first. And then there's two episodes that have come out already, right? Yes. So I'll then go back and watch those two episodes and catch up. So then you can tweet about it as they come out. And, and you can and do that, that on Netflix. Netflix, yeah. yeah. So it's the... If I, if I recall, too, it's the first show that Netflix has, right, where you can... It's on Netflix, but it's also on A and E, right? Right. Yes. The Simultaneously. Day, the day, well, the day after the episode airs, you can you can. That's amazing. See it. Isn't that great? Oh that's, yeah, that's phenomenal. That's the, yeah. that's the future. Like, there's no reason why like movies shouldn't. Everything should be. Do you know what I mean? Agreed. Like, what, it's the one of the shows that I that I did uh, a show called Supernatural. Um, in in parts of the world, they're they're a year or two behind. In the UK, they're a year behind. Yeah. So man, kind of like us with Downton, right? Isn't that how it works? Aren't we like seven to eight months behind Downton Abbey? Like what you see here? Oh, so. really? Yeah, yeah. And That's Sherlock, ridiculous. we tend to do that with Sherlock too. I think. Great show. Uh, great show. Oh my God, both Holy those shows moly. are amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't think I said his name, but he's. Uh, Mark Pellegrino, ladies hey. and gentlemen. Yeah, Yo. Sherlock is back to Sherlock. Right. Mark Pellegrino. Oh, uh, Sherlock is <laughs> so back to Sherlock. <laughs> <laughs> that show, like not to be as, you know, not to pull the hipster card, but I, every you, now you and then. walk around with a pipe and a yeah. cap. <laughs> <laughs> every now and then, um, I'll be bored on the internet and I'll want a, a new show to watch. And I'll, I'll need to pirate something that I've never heard of or that I can't find it. And I kept scrolling across this Sherlock. This was like five years ago or whatever. This was like seven months after Sherlock came out, before it even aired in the States. Because I don't think it aired in the States till after like the second season. And um, I'm like, yeah, I'll check this out. There's three of them. And I'm like, what? It's new, new. They're like movies? They're like 90-minute shows? And I'm like, eh, whatever. I'll start. I'll, I'll give one a shot because I really like just the mythos mm-hmm. of Sherlock Holmes. And next thing I know, like five hours later, I'm yeah, like, you're going through the next three. One? Yeah, you can't, you can't just watch one. I remember that one they show. had when, was this probably like the na- early 90s, late 80s? There was like that young Sherlock Holmes movie that came out. Oh, yeah. And he was like a kid. He was like at school with a kid. There was all sorts of like crazy, like sexual occult yeah. things going on. Yes. That yeah, blew my I mind when I was a kid. I remember that I one. I loved that. And then I ended up getting into like Hound of the Baskervilles and all of these oh, other stories because of that. By way of the show. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it worked. Wow, that's great. That's so good. Uh, Mark. Um, we like to start off the episode with the guests providing a fun fact about themselves or something they learned recently. Uh, no rules. It can be anything from a new way to tie your shoe or, you know, something about yourself. Any any sort wow, of Wow. Actually, the, the the fact that I came up with had some more to do with the place that I grew up than, okay. than actually me. Um, j- me. Yes. Um, but I, I, I think it's since, – since I grew up in Van Nuys, California, it's not a very distinguished place – I, I do like to say, so did Robert Redford. Oh, no way. Right? Okay. So, you know, there's, there's like two that. alums of Van Nuys who, you know, um, one with great stature and yeah. one with slightly less stature, but hopefully will have equal stature at some yeah. point. Yeah, I think Robert Redford could catch up to you, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I think yeah. he's got some learning to do. <laughs> yeah. Did you, did you see All is Lost? Did any of you guys see that? Yes. I love that Is it that phenomenal? Movie. I've heard nothing but good things, and I, I haven't seen, seen it. It's, it's great. And uh, he has like three words in the... In, in yeah, the I heard thing. the script is just all stage directions. All action. It's all action. Really? Yeah. It is I'm gonna crazy. Check it out. You should see it. it. I like Robert Redford. I'm a huge fan. Like, I shouldn't say huge fan. I'm a fan. Like, the main things, like, obviously, I love The Sting and, and Butch Cassidy and, you know, uh, all of those. But um, I love Spy Game. Spy Game was good. Spy Game was phenomenal. Uh, Here's a little third fact. Flight, that, what was that? The, the Condor? The third flight of the third Condor? What was that? Six one? Days of the Condor. Six Days of the Condor. Which is actually, oh, where is it? Third, yeah, three days of the three con- days of the condor in the movie. Six days of the condor in the, the book. book. That sounds right. right. Yeah, is that it? Yeah. Well, here's a fact. I saw all those movies when they came out. That's how old I am. <laughs> in yeah, a drive-in, in shit. Victory Drive-in. Yeah. I wanted to ask you. So Van Nuys, growing up in Van Nuys. Yeah. When you are born and raised in an area that's really, really close to L.A., but in many ways, kind of like a world apart. Do you feel a lot of that influence, or do you? Is it similar for you being like? 
once you grew up, like, I'm going to get out of here, I'm going to go to L.A. and do this, as the same way someone in Omaha might have felt? Because, or do you have a lot of that? Um, do you feel like you're in the shadow of that industry, or do you feel any of those influences into your life as you're a kid growing up in Van Nuys? I never, I never did feel like this, this need to get out of Van Nuys and go right. somewhere else to realize my dreams. And, and Van Nuys, I mean, literally a generation before me, it was orange you know, yeah. groves, you know, yeah. and farm It was land. Chinatown. Right? right? I mean, uh, yeah. And then, and then when I was growing up, it was kind of suburban, and then that changed to something else. And But it, I never felt like I was outside of the loop mm-hmm. there. You know, I felt at home, and I just, I, I, I didn't feel like any of my dreams were inaccessible to me by, by being there. And maybe it was because I had a really supportive mom, so... Yeah. Did you feel like you grew up around the industry in any no. way being in Van Nuys? No, my mom my mom and my stepdad worked at the Los Angeles Times newspaper. Oh, oh wow. And I, I never really felt very connected to the entertainment industry at all, even though it was a stone's throw away at yeah. Warner Brothers and Disney. And So uh, in that way, it could be similar to somebody in any sort of rural state yeah. or, or part of the country where they found that path to what they wanted to choose of their own yeah. kind of influence or their own kind of need to to be a performer or be a musician or something like that you found it in the same way even though you were so close to the city i feel like i've i found it by accident because what interested me growing up was um biology and marine oh, wow. biology and science and and that was kind of my thing until i got to college and discovered that it shouldn't be my thing because i wasn't <laughs> i wasn't that great at it i was yeah. i was good at more uh, different different pursuits and um and I kind of wandered into acting quite by accident. Where know? were you at school? I went to Cal State Northridge. Okay. Yeah. I went for a year, got straight A's, and then said, I don't think I want to do this. It didn't fulfill you. It didn't fulfill me. And, 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 and you know, in freshman year, you do this freshman orientation thing. So you jump ahead of 35,000 other people and get the classes that you want. And then the next year, you go right to the bottom of the line. And oh, you have wow. to do basket weaving and French and uh, needlepoint and yeah. whatever classes are available. And I, I just couldn't see myself suffering through a series of semesters to build up enough units to take the classes that I wanted. And I was in love with, a, with this crazy girl, and, and I was kind of in a band, and yeah. I just said, ah, I don't need this, and walked away from it at 19. Wow. Yeah. Did you, As you look back, did you have inf- like uh, ways that you had sort of dabbled or, or, or stepped into the light of, of acting or performing? Or was it a clear like watershed moment? Like you were like, I don't want to do this. What do I want to do? And then kind of went after it. I drifted a little bit. I drifted for a while and c- kind of played with this band. We played you know parties and little festivals. And I just kind of got lost in that and my relationship with the girl that I was with and 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 got into acting because I thought, oh, I got to do something besides work at a gas station and play in a garage band. What was the name of your band? Oh, God. Plenty of people in my hometown would disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, wait till you hear the name of a band, because it's not a very cool name. It was uh, called XL. That's a... XL. <laughs> extra large, or whatever you want. I don't yeah. know. Oh, it was the letters? It, well, yeah, kind of. Oh, man, oh, I, was, I was hoping the program. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, man, you, we're creating spreadsheets up here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty lame, but and, and we all went our separate ways. You know, one became a doctor, and another's like a banker. And I don't, I don't know what the drummer's doing, but they just, you know, bass. The bassist became a doctor. The, okay. the guitarist became like an IT guy. Were you the singer? Were you the I lead? was the singer. You yeah. were the singer, getting that light. Singer. Yeah, yeah. But that was in the that was that was in the eighties, in the late eighties. And and what was big at the time was that you know you know uh, bubblegum rock and roll and high energy rock and roll, high octane stuff that I didn't. It wasn't quite in my. In, in my octave, yeah, you know, and I, I and I sang it. I, I did my best to sing it, but it never. It made singing a very uncomfortable experience for me because I never quite knew if my voice was going to be able to stand up that yeah. night to, to the rigors of singing some of these songs. So stand up and shout. <laughs> no, uh, forgive me if if I missed the timeline. But so was the band happening during that freshman year, before or after you had. It, it happened. It happened after okay. after the freshman year. Yeah, it was kind of before too. We were, you know, we yeah. were all high school buddies, sure. and we kind of got together and started doing stuff, and and then it actually came together for you know some gigs, and and then you know they wanted to do more, you know, yeah, and I wanted to just was that you know, did that band stop. did the band in the performance end up being kind of a segue to the acting, or was it simultaneous? Just later, like later. several months later, just by chance, thinking I had to do something, I walked into a a modeling school yeah, you did. called okay. John Robert Powers baby. Oh, and yeah, I, I and and I didn't pay anything for John therapy. Robert Powers. 
JRP. Really? Good old JRP. It didn't. You didn't? Because... They let me come in there, and they took photographs of me for free. Wow. They knew what they had. Oh, yeah, baby. And then uh, and then they offered me a commercial workshop class for free. I took that, and the, huh. g- the guy thought I had talent. I had no idea what I was doing, and he set me up with an agent. Wow. And I started working before I knew anything about acting. Um, I got a couple jobs, but I was also not landing jobs. So my agent sat down with a piece of paper and said, these are acting schools and teachers <laughs> it, are, you know, kind of in the area here. Choose one that you like. And I chose the closest and the cheapest. And it happened to be probably the best acting school in on the West you have Coast. Your, this is like your own version of the kid stays in the picture. Yeah. You're like, you're like they asked me to take the pictures. Did I do it? You bet, you bet your ass I did. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Fully, and 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 then I, you know, s- several years later, I actually teach there from time to time, and and uh, it's a theater company that's pretty pretty cohesive unit of folks, and we do plays there. And, oh, that's awesome! In the off time, you know, that's really neat. It's yeah. interesting you mentioned you were in a band because one of the facts here I have pulled up is about Les Paul. Hmm. Uh, apparently, at the age of eight, he began playing the harmonica uh, after trying to learn the piano. Then he ended up switching the guitar, but it was when he was in that eight-year-old age range that he invented the uh, that little harmonica thing that goes on your shoulders, the uh, the you oh, know, neck stand. Yeah, for real. The, yeah, the thing Paul. that Bob Dylan would use. Yes. Yeah, Neil yeah. Young. Les Paul invented that thing. He invented that at eight years old. Yeah, around there, and that it's uh, me out. it it allows him to play both sides of the harmonica because he could. It was on like a swivel on all of that, so he could play it hands free. And the design has pretty much stayed the same since. Uh, since he invented it. So if he didn't design that awesome Les Paul guitar, he would have been a billionaire just from just designing the that. Stand, yeah. The That's harmonica crazy. apparatus. Isn't that crazy? That reminds me of a book that I read, a great book called A Man Called Intrepid. If you haven't read that book, you should read it. It's about it's about the man who saved the world in, in World War II, William Stevenson, this guy who was able to bring together like uh, Americans uh, and the uh, Brits and the uh, Canadians in aspiring and, and, a, and an espionage ring that was able to defeat the Nazis. And the things that he did were, were phenomenal. But one of the things, this is, reminds me of, that's why I'm saying it, yeah. was when he was like eight or nine, yeah. he, he, um, he would make uh, Morse code, Morse code uh, apparatus and actually um, tap out Morse code to the ships that were going by in the shipping lanes. Just for fun. Just yeah. for fun. He was just that guy. <laughs> And he, he, he wasn't just a brain either. He was he was the guy that um, he he was also a World War War One flying ace and a, a champion boxer. Holy and, hell! Yeah, uh, Sir William Samuel Stevenson um, was a Canadian soldier, airman, businessman, inventor, spy master. He is, uh, but many people consider him to be one of the real life inspirations for James Bond. How is this that not is a show? Correct. This guy's yeah. life not a, like a real show on Ian, Netflix. Or... Ian Fleming himself once wrote, "James Bond is a highly romanticized version of a true spy. The real thing is William Stevenson." That's it. That's the truth. And I'm actually a big fan of the Bond yeah. novels by the way. Yeah. Many of the claims about him in the 1976 biography A Man Called Intrepid uh have been disputed though, unfortunately, but it's, you know, it sounds like it's a uh, even if even if it's been disputed, the yeah. book is an amazing yeah. read. It's a great narrative history. And yeah, he uh, he at the young age he worked as a tel- uh, telegrapher. So that's you know I'm in between books right now, so I will completely do that. I recommend it. A man called Intrepid. A man called Intrepid. That's awesome. And I remember I was I was sitting in an airplane coming back from London, and I sat next to a guy in his 80s, blind, had lost his sight on the last day of of the war in Burma. <sighs> He was shot by a sniper through both of his eyes. Whoa. He told me a pretty cool story. His, yes. his wife, is, a, is, is I think she's still alive, she, she was a physicist, and she became part of this amazing operation called Operation Paperclip, which was the, the West's uh, uh, way of like wooing all the mines out of Germany, out of Nazi Germany. Oh, it's not the little logo from the original word. <laughs> <laughs> they designed yeah, that. Operate, no, yeah. that's, okay, so all the mines you were saying, all, all the great mines. You know, the Niels Bohr, who, yeah, yeah. who they kidnapped, uh, I guess, from the Netherlands, and uh, and his wife were brought over to the United States to work on the atomic bomb. 
Yeah, Operation Paperclip was the Office of Strategic Services program in which over 1,500 German scientists, technicians, and engineers <laughs> and other foreign countries were brought to the United States uh, for employment. My World War II veteran <clears throat> traveling story isn't as good, but very fun. A couple of months ago, maybe it was around the holidays, I'm, land, I'm at LAX waiting for luggage to come around, and I see this bag come, and it's, you know, people put ribbons, bows, old boyfriend's hair, locks, whatever, to like mem- to remember their bag. This bag comes around, and the entire thing on the cover is just half-naked women, like from magazines, like taped to this deal, right? And I'm like... I. I have to see the guy. <laughs> <laughs> the first, and then another bag comes by. No so now there's two bags going, and nobody is claiming it. these. And I'm like, "You had the balls, yeah, to put this on there, or lacked the intelligence, yeah. whichever one, to put these on there. You got to claim these you bags. Gotta claim them. So I'm standing around. I'm looking. I'm that's looking. worth the time. Like that's worth waiting. All of a sudden, I hear, "There it is," and I turn, <laughs> and there is a. I don't know, let's say 89-year-old World War II veteran in a wheelchair, but still, like, you can tell he's still yeah. got all the life about him. He's yeah. got his hat on and all the stuff that, that signifies who he is. There's a nurse behind him, and I go, sir, I am glad to grab these bags here. And I picked him up, and he goes, he goes look good, don't they? And I said, yes, sir. I still got it. Still got it, my man. And I, and I said, you know what? I said, thank you for your service as well, too. <laughs> Oh, that's great. But I was like, man, that's a great story. Yeah, because I'm like, in LA, I'm just waiting to see a dude with yeah. a Hurley visor and an yeah. Ed Tardy t shirt grab yeah. these bags. But it, no, it's just somebody from the greatest generation. Yeah. <laughs> I always get a kick out of that same scenario how everybody. It blows my mind how many people forget what their luggage actually looks like. Mm-hmm. Like, you'll be there waiting at the conveyor belt at the baggage claim, and people will go up to, like, grab a luggage. And I'm like, oh, is this mine? Is this mine? And it's not, right? Right. And then their luggage that they actually grab that's theirs looks nothing, nothing like, like it. Yes. Yeah. And you're like, you just max. Let's say we yeah. flew from New York. Yeah. Maximum. You saw this luggage six and a half hours ago. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you but, already forgot. Do you know was, where your kids yeah. are? It was, six yeah. and, it was six and a half hours ago, but also about 12 cocktails later. Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Otherwise, I imagine these people never knowing what street they're on. This yeah. looks like my and, street. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is, this, is this the street I turn on? Is this the street I turn on? Yeah. yeah uh, I, have a, I have a tag on my bag that says my clothes wouldn't look that good on you. <laughs> oh, that's great. So That's great. I mean, they don't look that good on me, so... <laughs> You know, it's funny that, um, and thank you for having me yeah, uh, yeah. guest host and drop in with you. It's funny you did this because I'm currently working on this, sh- uh, writing on a show for PBS called You're Doing It Wrong. Okay. In which case, I think I've heard of that. we take like everyday tasks, and it's just this fun little show. It's going to live on their digital It's with the thing. Sklars. It is I just the, read about that yeah, yesterday. Yeah. The Sklar brothers uh, are hosting it, and they asked me to come on and be a writer for it. But it's so funny or fortuitous that I'm getting to do the show because that the idea of that show is built around learning new ways to do things that you do every day like how to do them wrong like i just learned and i didn't know this washing your hands i've always hated dryers like hand dryers Mm -hmm. i just they take for if you're in like a busy restroom and there's three dudes waiting behind you to to wash your own hands most people never wash their hands fully dry with those Mm -hmm. and you transfer germs faster with wet hands than you do with dry hands and the other thing i learned too hot water doesn't matter it's it, the soap. That's all that matters. Right. The, you, in order to get the water hot enough to kill the bacteria on your hands, you'd burn your hand before you got it that sure. hot. It doesn't make any difference. And then somebody goes, well, what about dishes? Well, if, unless you're soaking them, yeah. it still doesn't matter because you're having it cold enough at least to get your hands under that water. Yeah. If, it, if they're hot enough to kill the bacteria, it doesn't matter. And I never, I never knew that until we started working on this show. Now, did you learn... <clears throat> Because with the hand dryers, I've heard this, too. Uh, like, a lot of people, they'll just put their hands under the dryer and expect it to do work, but it'll actually dry faster if you, like, you gotta, almost massage the water into your hand. Like, oh, yeah, you, unless you, know, you get sure. one of those accelerators with those wind blades. Yeah. You know, those, oh, those things. Like, yeah, the yeah. knife or whatever they call that, wind knife. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're just, like, up and down with those things. Yeah. yeah. They don't want you touching your own hands. No. But, yeah, no, I can't stand. It's weird that you need... You, to be most effective, you don't want to be health conscious. Because you ever notice this too when people have hand dryers and then the way to exit the bathroom is to pull the door? Yeah. And yeah. you're like, That's so wild. thank you. So now everybody who didn't wash their hands has opened this door. And I did. And I have to open this door too. Yeah. Right. That, That's that, why I always do it with a paper towel or something. Always. Something covering. That's why I have but, my jeans. 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then there's there's the additional thing that the, the the water won't matter, the soap won't matter if you don't wash your hands long enough. Yep. Right? Yeah. Don't you have to sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star Yeah, or twice Happy through? Birthday twice. Either what? one of those. Really? Yes. Sure. The full song or just Happy the Birthday? The full song. You got to do, you gotta do it in time. Right. Twice, mm -hmm. and then and then all that. While you're washing your hands, yes. yep. great thing about that too. Like if you're ever in a scary bathroom, let's say rest rest area, and you're like somebody here might kill me. Everyone will leave you alone if you're the guy singing songs to himself in the bathroom. <laughs> <room. laughs> and it, 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 <laughs> depending how you're singing it too, like yes. if you're like happy birthday. <laughs> yeah. You know, they'll, they'll do not run, worry. Like run, with force, worry, forcefully washing your hands. Yes. Do not, Happy do not worry. You're safe. <laughs> you are safe. Another one that we did that I thought uh, people might find interesting. Um, they, there's a way in which you're completely texting wrong. There's two of these, actually. There's another one that's really good as well. But did you know that texting, so the average head weighs like 10 to 12 pounds? Okay. But I, in the, I, I learned that from Jerry Maguire. Yes, yes. Okay. In the standard motion of how people text... You end up putting sixty pounds of pressure on your spinal cord. So, if you're like bent over, ever looking at a text message in any way, you're you're just like racking your spinal cord with close to six times the amount of pressure that you're normally putting on it. And over the course of time, people they said that like we could eventually reach a time in future where we're all just kind of like hunched over, back to primate Some, form, almost. something like Wally, like when people stop moving and everybody just became fat and lethargic. Like we could end up like being very big trapezius muscles, yes, like, like, no, our necks sunk yeah. down, yeah, 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 yeah. and our just our heads like kind of protruding out and from putting all that on our so, side. I never knew that. So what should you do? If at all possible, always bring the phone up to your level, up to your. But then eye you're going to get a ticket. Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I didn't say that. That's that's, that's funny because I. <laughs> On the on the way here, I took a picture of like me holding up my wrist to my steering wheel, and I'm just like practicing learning how to drive with my new Apple Watch. <laughs> oh my <laughs> gosh, the Apple I Watch! I want one of those so bad. Like I'm I'm a huge I love Don't technology. Don't do it to yourself. I love technology and all that, and I just I want Dick Tracy. I want to be no, able to like. Do not do that. Do you know what one of the greatest greatest but they look things so neat. to ever happen to the cell phone was? No. The pocket. <laughs> because there are times Listen. when you're at a meeting yes. or a podcast yeah. or a dinner when you yeah. don't want it to distract you, yes. right? You I are agree. not going to be able to get away from that. I agree. I've already mentally in my head written up the New Yorker cartoon yeah. about the guy who looks over his shoulder during a movie, yeah. and it's just all these watches lighting up the entire oh, place. Lord. You're, the thing is, is you're absolutely right, and I still want one. <laughs> no. It's going to ruin you. It's yeah. going to ruin you. The other quick thing I want to tell yeah, from yeah, the yeah. show that I thought Absolutely. was really cool. Absolutely, yes. Uh, cleaning up glass. Most of us were doing it wrong. Do you know the best way to clean up? Like if you say you break, break a glass in, a, in an area of like your floor or even on your table, one of the best ways to clean up glass? Let me, let me see if I know this one. Yeah. S some kind of wet paper towel. Mm -mm. No, That's what I thought too. Right? Okay. Piece of bread. Get out. You put a piece of bread on it and then press that down with a paper towel and it'll pick up every little shard of glass. Does it matter what kind of bread? Like I you want to go Wonder, to marble I rye. Think real marble <laughs> no, rye. No, I'm thinking Wonder Bread would be far more absorbent <laughs> yeah. for that. Because Probably. It, because it's not actually made yeah. of yeast or right. anything yeah, that goes It's just a yeah. sponge. And it's so the area that you have, you just and that'll get up the <laughs> smallest piece of glass that really? you can't even see. Just every little sliver. Yeah. And then also, I never thought of this. Um we made a joke about it in the show that hopefully people will check out when these start dropping in May, I believe, on, at PBS.com. Um, never use your broom ever to clean up uh, glass. Anything or just glass? Just you never use your broom because what happens is shards will go up into the bristles, and the next time you sweep, you're going to spread glass shards. And they actually wrote in one of the articles I read, uh, <laughs> if you do use your broom... Make sure you throw it away afterwards and get a new one. Which I made the joke. That is the most first world thing I've yeah. ever. Wow. Read. Yeah. Just of course. Go get a new get broom. A new broom. <laughs> like, how much do I like this broom? Who cares? We'll get a new one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bread. That Never makes... use a broom and always use bread. Wait, now that's also a first world problem to use bread. Oh yeah. To, <laughs> exactly. To clean up. Yeah. Glass. What do you want to do with this uh, nursery? Yeah. Uh, this food that could really <laughs> sustain us for a couple of days. Ah, use yes. it to clean. Let alone the fact that we're just going around breaking glass everywhere we go. Well, it's like the song. Yeah. That's interesting. That's really neat. Now, Mark, that's a great uh, fact. Yep. Mike was telling me you're a huge fan of like comic books and stuff like that because we had yeah. a, he, he mentioned that you'd love the the fact that we record in a comic book shop. Love that. What uh, I got in here about in your, half hour early just to look around really? to see if there was what's anything. in your wheelhouse. You know, hundred bullets is in my okay. wheelhouse. <laughs> with American it. Vampire, like Image and Vertigo comics. Yeah, okay, uh, st stuff like that. Um, Walking Dead, of course. I'm yeah. a huge fan of the comic uh, series. 
uh, the preacher. Okay. Um, do that is that being? Did that just get cast? I think they did. I, I think, think they, they are doing that, doing that yeah, right now. Yeah. There was also a thing called the Cape by Joe Hill that was kind of. Oh, interesting. I feel like I've heard about this. The prequel is even is I feel even like I've better. Heard about the Cape. Was that a show once too? No, but you know there was a Joe Hill show called a uh, comic series called Lock and Key mm-hmm. that they made into a pilot. I actually was in it. I played, oh, that's awesome. I played the dad. Um, Wait, but, the Cape was a TV show, was it? Unless no, not, it's a different Cape. I think it's a different Cape. There was oh, a Cape where a, a cop gets framed or whatever. Then he's got like a magic cape or whatever. And Get like out! Hides out in like the circus or something like that. Right? Is that the what I'm thinking? I thought of? it was on NBC. Maybe yeah. The when Cape TV series six uh, years ago, 2011. Oh, so okay. four, years, four ago. years ago. The Cape is an American superhero drama. Um, da, 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 da. The series set in fictional Palm City, California, follows Vince Faraday, an honest detective who decides to leave the police force after he witnesses the murder of new police chief by mysterious villain known as Chess. Um, he ends up getting uh, abducted, and then he he's in- involved. They, he gets recruited into the uh, Carnival of Crime, a traveling circus bank robbery ring, and he's taught how to use like. A special cape made entirely of spider silk. So it's like he can, really? he can do all these tricks with this cape. Apparently, well, yeah. this is darker than that. Yeah. This, this this guy gets a, a cape and become and uses superpowers that the cape endows him with to do very bad things. To get revenge on people. I like it. Right. I like it. It's very dark. And then the prequel is how the cape came to be. So uh, do you find check that in your comics or even your like? Um, your stories where a person takes it upon themselves to correct what went right, what went wrong. Do you find that you want the brutality, like of like what the Punisher like really was, or like anything where they're like, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna kill you because you killed the person that I love, or because you did something wrong. I find that more often than not, I I, I don't get as good of like satisfaction out of the storyline if they just catch them. Or if they have them by the, you know, let's say the guy falls off the edge of the building and, the, and our our hero, like, grabs him and is holding on to him. And nine times out of ten, they always have it where he pulls him back on and yeah. he's like, you were, what you did was wrong. I want him to just be like, see you, man, and let it go. And, and, there like, are, and there are versions of Batman that are like that. Yeah. And, and that is satisfying because I, I just think it's a, uh, maybe, a, maybe I sound a little bit Cro-Magnon, but I just feel like that's kind of a sense of justice and that satisfies me too i'm the same way as you i'm a huge fan of comeuppance right i'm a huge fan of comeuppance and i've always said like if i if i had superpowers i would be considered a super villain just because of like i like justice i'm a huge fan of justice comeuppance i have that you know what i mean like here's a trivial fact i have that tattooed on my shoulder justice or comeuppance the asian signal uh, symbol for justice okay oh really i think it's the most important concept in human civilization i mean i think it's it's good that when you see the brutality that's going on you know in in other parts of the world people being thrown off buildings or, Mm -hmm. or their heads getting cut off with knives that you feel not just repulsion but rage yeah that you want to do something comparable to that that doesn't put you on their level because you're fighting for innocence, and that right. and that makes you good, right? Because your 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 force is retaliatory, and it's against someone who is guilty. Yeah, and, and I think that's the key too, retaliatory. Like you are writing something, you are you're reacting. Co- yes, exactly. You, you are reacting to yeah. something. Right. Don't be the seeker. Don't be the actor. Like uh, my grandpa always said, like don't ever be the guy who starts the fight. Yeah. If you are in a bad mood, or you feel like you're angry about something, then, then that's your problem. And, you know, go work that out. And, like, talk to the people who made you upset and do something about it. But don't be the guy who's ever, I'm out here and I'm going to look for a fight. On the other hand, always, if it involves you, or somebody is, it's, it, something needs to you know, be taken care of, you can be the guy who ends it. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and that's kind of, I've been in one fight in my life and I was hit first. Yeah. Because like, I've never been that guy who, and I've actually been around people who are like, oh, I think I'm going to get in a fight tonight. And I'm like, you know Close what, why don't mind. you not, man? Or just yeah. go home. Where Where was that? It was up in Wisconsin at my family's cottage. Just a, a friend of a friend had come up to my family's place. We were at a bar, and he's like, think about getting in a fight here. And I'm like, yeah, how about you don't? Yeah. And he was like, all right, man, out of respect for you and your family, I'm not going to do that. But if we were in my hometown, I'd be doing some crazy stuff tonight. And where's that, Montana? Or- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, and I said to him, I go, first of all, uh, uh, I don't know why you feel that way, but I will say that uh, – Thank, I respect you for knowing that you shouldn't be doing that here, but you should probably do that all the time. Like, say that you don't need to bring that yeah. sort of like energy or that attitude into any area of anywhere. Your life. Yeah, we're in a bar, we're having a drink, we're having a good time. Why do you yeah. want to punch somebody in the face? Why does that make you want to punch you somebody know why in the I face? Think, I think a lot of those people. It's because 
they want to get punched in the face. You think? Like I, I the people who have like started fights because they they want to get beat up. Like they, there's something in that there's about like, them. There's a like, crisis of self-esteem yeah, going on yeah, there. Yeah, wow. I wanted to ask I you guys a, a question about comics too. So, yes. tell me if I'm wrong because I might be uh, highly uninformed. Is the Joker revered as one of the most interesting and greatest villains because he's, and I might be completely wrong on this, which we can edit out. <laughs> uh, because <laughs> I'm wrong, edit it. Because he's one of the people who's origins we know least about or there's like a discrepancy as to exactly how that came about because he's the red he was, was the red hood red hood right he, and different, he definitely he, was because i feel like there's like somewhere they're like he probably was it depends there there was uh jason todd i would love today learn i would love to learn this today as jason well. <laughs> todd came back as a red hood recently um or hush is what he now goes by right um i could be wrong but um there's, there's no discrepancy about the origin of the Joker. I guess that's my main question. I'm sure. Well, Crisis was Crisis was Crisis DC or Marvel? I always confuse Crisis versus Secret. I don't know. DC. Crisis of Infinite Earths was DC, and they reset a lot of things. Like Lex Luthor used to be a mad scientist who was very smart, and he was like he like uh, like that's why Gene Hat Gene Hackman's Lex Luthor was based off of you know more like a flamboyant type of mm-hmm. you know he got the green suit and all that, and then later on after Crisis he became if I remember correctly I could be mistaken some things he became like the businessman and the the suit and right. tie guy. Um, but I believe the Joker started off as like a a, a petty thief. Uh, petty thief Red Hood. Yeah, like, I read the book and everything, thing, but then right? I felt like that was even like a I could be I okay. could be completely wrong. Do you know this? Are you? I am not uh, Versed an expert on in the Batman, the Batman. Uh, Joker thing, but I think I definitely think the Joker is one of the most um, revered, mainly because of just as the not only as he an iconic evil clown, but he also uh, in every incarnation of him, he's got a different intricacy. I think to him, right? But didn't I mean, he? Didn't he? Uh, maybe I'm not remembering this right. Because he's did, violent. Didn't he's he kill one... Batman's? Parents in a robbery. I mean, well, in in the movie, yeah, he like did. Yeah, that was that. in the, yeah. the, the in the Tim Burton movie, he killed his parents. Right. Um, in the comic, so book, dropping him into the show. chemical vat, all yeah. this stuff that wasn't didn't have its origins in the comic book at all. No. I know that in the but killing he did joke, fall in the comics, it was he the did. killing joke where he killed Robin right after he found out who his mom was. Yeah, Jason Todd, right? Yeah, yeah. the new Robin. There was like a new Robin, Brand and then he finally Robin. gets to like meet his long lost mom, and then yeah. like the next page, Joker beats him to death with a crowbar. Yeah. And then Joker showed up to Barbara Gordon's house and just shot her and paralyzed her. Oh, my God. Yeah. All to, like, get at Batman. provoke Batman. Yeah, yeah just to provoke him. Batman. And he doesn't want to kill Batman. That's the thing. Like, he always tries to kill Batman, but, like, he doesn't because he's so crazy. He just wants that. He just wants someone he, to play with. He's the Moriarty, too, yeah, uh, right? exactly. He wants the... Exactly that. Like, Batman... Here's something that I... I mean, it's... Speaking of that, like the Joker and Batman are pretty much like I mean Batman's considered the world's greatest detective in in that world, um, which is Sherlock Holmes. Uh, then you have like the Joker, who's this maniacal, you know, Moriarty version, which is almost exactly what Sherlock and Moriarty were before Batman. And uh, then th- this was a realization to me. I'm going to sound like an idiot, but it really just dawned on me last week that the Incredible Hulk is just Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde. There you go. Yeah, I right. never realized yeah, I never that really, till last week. That's that's that was my comic book that I collected really? as, a, as a kid. Yeah, I was loved Hulk? Incredible Hulk. Yeah. So you were all into the, the the splitting of the red and the green and the grays. Uh, yeah. Oh well, I, didn't, I remember well, the gray I, and the, I, I, the I had, green. I had dropped out of the series by then, and then I picked it up since and kind of um, looked at it. Uh, so I, I didn't go all those permutations okay. really. But can I ask um, you a question as a fan of his? Yeah. Why Why do you feel like there were so many different? Like so many reincarnations of him in film recently over the past fifteen years, you know, I think they just had to get it right. I don't know. I, I, you know, Hulk has never struck me as a character that had a, a lot of play with people, um, um, but I think they, they, I think people like the idea, like Jekyll and Hyde and the Wolf Man, where where somebody's inner, you know, alter mm-hmm. ego gets released and mm-hmm. has almost. Almost infinite power, you know. Um, it satisfies something in them to see. And then the Hulk is a, is not an immoral bad thing. He's he's a, he's actually good. He's basically good. Um, so I don't. I, I, I guess the the short answer is I don't know why they've been doing it. Yeah. They've been trying to. Get, I really I like the, right. the John Woo one. Uh, you did? Yeah, I, I liked some Derek of the. Banner. I, I like some of the elements of how Hulk was presented. Like remember, he's jumping like mm-hmm. a half a mile at yeah. a time. I That's loved cool. that imagery. Yeah. I, I was like, oh, this is 
phenomenal to see. Yeah. I felt that same way in the most recent um, Superman. And I know it wasn't like widely regarded as, as a lot of people liking it, but a lot of those the cinematic elements of those fighting scenes yeah. are phenomenal. Yeah, people are disturbed by the fact that they were like tearing down the entire city. But to... go watch Doomsday. What do you think it looked like right. at the end of the, like or watch? I mean, read. Yeah. Go read the Doomsday Saga and be like, they destroyed that city. That's what happens in almost all of these major comics. Right. Is like you could just flip through covers of old X Men and be like, yeah. oh, that city's obliterated. That city's obliterated. <laughs> that's hap- That's yeah. what happens, right? I always, I always wanted to write a movie. Uh, <laughs> Based on that type of thing, where it's like the movie takes place after aliens attacked or uh, uh, the heroes or whatever, and it's just the cleanup guys. Like, yeah, it's the the construction workers coming in. Yeah, Dave from accounting's got to go back into his office the day after Superman (laughs) blew through there. Like, yeah, I would, I would, I'd watch that short. That like, there's you could have a lot of humor in that. Now, did you? Were you? did you get into the Hulk comics because you were such a, uh, a huge fan of science? Because growing up, you mentioned you you like you that or what? What interested you in the Hulk versus all the other? Yeah, you know, Spider Man was is one of the you know one of the most relatable. I'm Batman's my jam. I'm a huge Batman fan. He's my my favorite of all time. But Spider Man, when it comes to relatability, like he's got you know he's got girl problems, he's got job problems, he's got family problems. But um, as a kid growing up, you know, to to just go right to the Hulk. That's a you know an interesting. Well, I think I think when you're a kid, you kind of gravitate towards the character that uh, s- somehow reflects something in you that you want or admire or feel is lacking in you. And because uh, my my stepbrother and I, he collected Daredevil comics. Okay. And um and he tended to be a lot more intellectual and practical, but you know a little um, uh, shy and withdrawn. And and there had to be something about that character yeah. that pulled that out. And for me, I think, you know, I I, I grew up. You know, not 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 to get too personal, but I felt I feel like I grew up repressing uh, my anger and and my rage. Okay, and um, it, it, even when I when I tried to extrovert it more in the martial arts and stuff that I got into later on in life, uh, it, it, I still feel like I, I'm afraid of it. And I, I and I think there was something in that eight year old kid that was savvy to that mm-hmm. in a, in a very basic way, and gravitated to that to that comic book for that reason. So that's, that's my feeling. Of it. And, and plus Spider-Man, you know, when, when I was collecting comics in 76, 77, you know, the number one Spider-Man was $5,000. Yeah. And that, so those are just a little bit, you know, out of my league. And there was, I don't know, he, he didn't appeal to me at the time. He appeals to me more now. Yeah. You know, but it's interesting because there's three elements of the Hulk, right? So there's, uh, uh, doc, I'm forgetting. Bruce Banner. Bruce Banner. Bruce Banner. So like, there's that element if you're reading it, and then there's the transitional element of like what makes him lose that temper or what happens to him in going from from being Bruce to being the Hulk, and then there's everything that happens in the course of any storyline where he's just the Hulk. Right. And if I could like totally uh, conjecture for the, for the entire hour that we've known each other, that some of the Hulk pretty much is doing. He pursues when he's the Hulk. He pursues. The interest of like catching someone or following someone or breaking through some wall, and it, I felt like it was kind of interesting that you were able to do that even in yourself. Like when you were like, "This biology and doing this sort of coursework isn't for me. I'm now going to pursue this next huh. thing." Yeah. And the Hulk would kind of, you know, in a breaking down a building, go through the same thing of being like, "This is I'm moving on to this thing now." Like that freedom of that ability. The Hulk has a lot of freedom to really just kind of punch through or pursue whatever he wants to. Yeah, and you know what too? As, as crazy as this may seem, he's he's always provoked. It's always retaliatory, and the Hulk would never hurt you if you're not trying to hurt right. him. Right. And I kind of like that element yeah. of him. And he's too he's too simple in a way, too basic to have any other agenda. So it's it's completely innocent, mm-hmm. and and maybe that appealed to me too. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely he's he's he's. Back to almost like what we were talking more like justice to an extent. Like if you if if you're the reason for provoking his inner demons to to cause that, he's going to you know seek vengeance of some sort or whatever or correct the situation. Right. You know, versus like uh, you know like if if the Hulk's going on a rampage and all that, he's and there's like a kid or whatever, he's not going to mess with a kid unless the kid he sees him as a threat almost. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know. What yeah. I mean? Yeah. Well, he never messed with he never Correct. messed with kids. He, he was loved, always the he loved children. Yeah, and and it's almost almost to uh, like the 
the army, if I remember correctly, and I mean, obviously in the newer movies, but as well as even in the, the TV show and in the comics, he was always a lot of times being provoked by the government. And that's why he was seen as like a villain, right? Like, cause he was, he was sought after by the, the armed forces and they would always, he would turn into the Hulk and they would attack him for being this monster. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. Just like a lack of understanding. Yeah. Can I ask you a question, Mark? That's like totally, uh, apart from this conversation. Sure. Um, so I'm a fan of the work that you've done, whether it's like Dexter and Lost, and, and uh, I definitely want to check out your new show. But I'm interested to ask you, and if it's okay, and yeah, I know I'm just absolutely. the guest host. No, no. How fortunate does it feel to be in what most people are considering is truly like the newest golden age of television? That you have done, you've been a part of projects and worked on things that are going to go down as being revered as this era of TV where the entertainment could not be better and the accessibility to get that entertainment and, the, and, and to to build on that much like we were discussing how uh the return is on you know terrestrial tv yeah, it's also that transition purposes, time like, yeah. and it's on netflix which is a streaming service that is you know taking on goliath <laughs> taking that, on i mean, mean it's I, I think, it's it's a it's a cohesion yeah. it's a it's a symmetry it's a uh symbios of both right it's you know one of the firsts to do that. Mm-hmm. But you look at it, I mean, it really starts, what, 2000 with The Sopranos, it kind of feels yeah, like. I think they and it, the- with The Sopranos and Dexter and House of Cards and True Detective and my current favorite show on television, Hannibal on NBC, and obviously the, the work that you did on Lost and all those things. Like, we are in an era of you can't, if you're saying, if you're one of these people that wants to, I thought this to myself yesterday, I'm so glad I'm not one of those people who inherently wants to go against the grain that has to be like, oh, fuck TV, just because that's a thing that people do. Yeah. I'm so glad I'm not that because the amount of entertainment that's available to you is amazing. So I was interested in you, like, how fortunate does it feel for you to kind of be a part of what is going to be considered one of the greatest eras of, enter- of American entertainment and television? It feels great. But to, to speak to this thing that you said first about Netflix and, and Amazon and iTunes mm-hmm. and... Um, I, I, I'm a big fan of <clears throat> decentralization. I love liberty, you know, and I love that people are able to make so many more choices now. And the idea that these these distributors are coming up and enabling one tons of filmmakers and tons of people to make um, f- films, TV shows, webisodes that are immediately accessible to people. Uh, by doing that, I think they're going to make the studio system rather abs- obsolete pretty soon, and it won't be about packaging projects anymore because um you know there's a billion ways now that you can get yourself started in 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 a film or in some kind of um some something that episodic uh mm-hmm. serial kind of thing that people are, are going to see and so i i feel like i'm witnessing the demise of something very old you know and, you know the studio system as well as as a, an old kind of stodgy way of doing television. And now it's filmic and now it's cinematic and they're bringing, they're bringing feature film actors in and, and feature film writers and, and, and feature film directors. Um, and, it's, and it's no mistake that at this time, TVs are becoming yeah. theatrical yeah. in scope, yeah. you know? And, and so it's what they can do is playing, you know? And, and I, I feel great to be, you know, even in a small way, a part of... A part of invention you know and yeah. part of progress yeah that will change people's lives forever yeah you're it's definitely the you know their their directors their their theatrical director's cuts on television do you know with you know uh in in the sense that they're a full story these 13 episode seasons or you know mm-hmm. these cinematic tv shows now are amazing content and it's not filter down into an hour and a half like a, a a movie studio would force. So it's you have a full <laughs> Yeah, I always think there's some people complain about hour. things left out in Games of Thrones. Absolutely. I'm like, what do you think this would be if they had only gotten to make a movie, right? Yeah. <laughs> You're I mean, getting a 10-hour movie but once the, a year. You know? But then what I like about these these uh, new TV shows is most most network television goes 22 episodes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's nearly impossible to write a good show for 22 episodes Absolutely. year after year after year after year. I think The Good Wife brags about the fact that it's able to do it but most shows cannot it's a real struggle so the fact that these shows are doing 10 12 13 8 episodes enables them to make each 
each one a cinematic experience. Yeah. Yeah. Fargo is what comes to mind with like Far- eight absolutely. episodes. Fargo, and they're able to have an arc. They're, they they yeah. know where they're going instead of inventing it as it's going along and painting themselves into narrative yeah. corners. Yeah. They they don't they don't do that anymore. They and know I, where they're going. I hope that the networks end up finding a way rather than fighting to fold in. And I think you see some of that in the ideas of television shows that are that are starting to be made, and also the 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 types of people who are being put on these shows. That because you watch a show, you watch a show like uh, like The Return, or you watch something like um, on, on AMC like Breaking Bad or something like that, a lot of those people don't look like what would be your network that they'd want to parade out for up yeah. front and stuff like that. And so you're now getting them to be like, oh, we want to see more interesting types of people. We want to see real people with real stories and real pacing. Like Personally, feel free to disagree with me. I don't think five years ago a show like The Last Man on Earth would be on network television. Is that based on The Last Man, the comic books? No, the why Last The Last Man? Man? It's, it's, it's got to be a little bit, at least. I mean, really? it's, it's not, it's not. but Why The Last Man is a great graphic yeah, I've re- novel. I've read, a, I've read a couple of them. Um, I just was watching that pilot, and I'm like, I can't believe this is on network television. It's, it's so be, weird, and the pacing is so different from everything else, and you're, you have one character you're introducing an episode. Yeah. It's just so different, and I think a lot of that is the influence of you know, Netflix, was it last year they announced we want to, they wanted to invest a billion dollars yeah. in new content? I mean, the new Daredevil series looks yeah. phenomenal. That trailer yeah. looks phenomenal, and that's <laughs> going to be on Netflix. And then, I mean, what you got HBO Go and Amazon now and even Hulu starting HBO Vimeo. announced yesterday, yesterday. That, that, that they're, they're, they're going to be on Apple TV, and then there's also going to be a streaming service through yeah. Apple that's going to have ABC and CBS and, and they're ESPN. They're in September. Yeah. They, Apple just announced that. And that's, um, you know... Mark Duplass just had a had a uh, he was speaking at South by Southwest and he mentioned you know don't be afraid of video on demand or making movies for video on demand because it's definitely where it's going to see the end of the studio system to an extent but you're also there's no reason with the technology that we have that you can't make what used to be a fifteen million dollar movie and make it into a video on demand for a little bit less and still make that money back because mm-hmm. it's. You like know, a lot less. I mean, they did an episode of Modern Family on an iPhone. I saw the. Sp- and, I saw a part and of on that. Sundance, a movie premiered that was yeah. done entirely on an iPhone. It's amazing. I mean, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> death of the studio system in the sense that unless they innovate and unless they mm-hmm. go, all right, I'm going with the technology. Yeah. I'm not going to try to fight it. Uh, I'm going to do what's right. That's the only way they're going to stay in business. Is if yeah. they say, let's let's now all get together and and make it even better. So yeah. Yeah. Somebody compared the current time in television to what the 70s were like in the film industry where they said that anybody with a script and a beard could get a meeting and you, that's where you got like Coppola and, and all of these. Scorsese. Yes, and, you know, and yeah, because and Easy Rider like just changed yeah. everything. And that's kind of how it is now that if you have a really, really good idea and anyone that you can get that in front of, this is a different time in terms of like television and content where like they somebody would take a look somebody at you. So, I mean, it used content. to be that like you... You were a writer's assistant. You got a cu- you got a couple of spec scripts. Then you got on a writer's job. And like, no one wanted to see your own project until you'd spent so much time in the industry. And now it's like, well, there's so many different avenues to take that project that yeah. it could be picked up. Because somebody could be interested in it and be like, this does fit for us. We yeah. can do that. I know people who who get representation from great managers and agents based on a YouTube video that they did that had three million hits. Yeah, yeah. one thing. Yeah. And that well, turns into a gold mine of other things for them. The um, uh, <clears throat> his name's escaping me. He just did the Chappie movie. Oh, uh, Neil Neil uh, Blomkamp. Ba- uh, yes, or, I'm pronouncing Bl- that wrong. Blomkamp. I, I am as well. But he's he essentially Tomorrow was discovered from a, a YouTube video, which was the like a a, was a a short of District Nine, I believe. It was like a 12 minute District Nine short, from what if I remember correctly. Yeah. And then it ended up. Blowing up, and then they turn it into a full blown movie. That's crazy. I liked that movie. Oh, that was a good District one. Nine. Oh, yeah. yeah good I love any movie that's entertaining me while educating me, like yeah. giving me a point of perspective. Social commentary. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. when you do one, it becomes too heavy handed. When you do the other, it seems frivolous. Yeah. And you can do them at the same time. We're, we're in a good spot. Yeah. That's great. why, like, X Men was such a great, you know, concept because it's, you know, you're, it's entertaining with these superpowers and all that, but then it's also got the social commentary of, you know, they're outsiders and they're mm-hmm. new and pe- they're different than people and people are judging them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I haven't watched a lot of the old zombie movies, but I hear that that's prevalent a lot too. Like they, the zombie movies are like commenting on like consumerism and... and I think uh, that was Romero's idea. Yeah, Romero, yeah, yeah exactly. That's who it was. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I, lo- I love, Romero. I love the time we're in, man. And I'm, I will tonight because I'm not going to go out and get hammered. I'm going to check out your show. Wow, you're not going to go out and get hammered. No, if I was in Chicago, can, can you do both? <laughs> is it possible to get hammered and check out my show? Yes, it probably is. I live across the street from a bar. I could be, I could finish it and then be like, I'm going to go talk to somebody about this. <laughs> I'm not trying to push you in that direction. No, Stan. I'm just making no. A I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an <laughs> Illinois farm kid. We're not too far away from being pushed into drinking. I love Chicago. I love Chicago. Oh, yeah, that's it's a great one city. One of my favorite cities on Fun the planet. City. Did you ever live there? Or have you always lived around here in Southern California? I always lived in Southern California. You never mean, did like a New York stint or anything. I mean, I've worked in New York, of course. so I've been there for you know a couple months at a time, and I work up north in Canada. I was up in Canada for the last year and a half, two years. Really? Yeah. Whereabouts? Where were you? Vancouver. Okay. I've yeah. never been. Yeah. Montreal is all I've I love uh, Montreal. Yeah, I went there for the comedy festival. Okay. And, yeah, just for the I mean, it was my first time there, and I'm like, we're in Europe. Right? This is the most European city in North America. Yeah, very much. Yeah, and I loved it. Absolutely did, loved did it. Did you find any particular places there that you liked? Because I, I, the, the show that I used to do called Being Human was out uh-huh. in, it was Boston, supposed to be mm-hmm. Boston, but it was actually Montreal where we filmed it. No, the crazy thing is when you go to do a festival, it's just a series of white conversion vans and, and hotels and theaters. Mm-hmm. So every place I ended up, like there were three places that I absolutely loved and I had no clue where we were. Right. Because you end up being like, oh, there's a place over here across the street. I think I had poutine at a bar called Nick's and it was phenomenal. Nick's. I was trying to find a place that looked like they weren't, give, like you didn't have to be a part of a tour guide. To, yeah. Like a tour right. guide didn't find that place. Like you were like, oh, over here, this is, and, it, and I absolutely loved it. That's one of the only places I remember going. Um, that I knew where I was at. Yeah, you got to do but the poutine. I, I loved do, it. Yeah. I loved the whole Just don't experience. say poutin. Poutin? Don't say poutin. <laughs> what is it? Very... No, poutin is... Um, yeah? And that's it. Oh, I could go for some poutin. Poutin? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'd like uh, some poutin. <laughs> uh, here's, a, here's a completely random uh, fact here. The equal sign mm-hmm. looks the way it does... Because there are two parallel lines that are uh, that's as equal, equal as you can apart. be. They're equal distance apart and they're equal length, and that's the the most equal you can be is parallel. That's where that comes out of. Yeah, it, wow. it, it means uniform. Uh, it's from the Latin word equalis, meaning uniform and identical, and that's where they used to be. <laughs> it used to be longer, but that's why it looks that way because it's there are two lines of uh, uniform distance and they're parallel to each other. Hmm. I and did not. And who invented it? Uh, a long time ago. I wonder that. Yeah, uh, you think Johnny, that was all? Johnny equal sign? No. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mister equal sign to you. <laughs> I wonder if those things always all happened at the exact like. Did one, is one person responsible for the greater than or less than or greater than or less than or equal to? It it always has to come out of one person. It has mind, to, right? right? Yeah. Even if even Squared. if we never remember who they are. Yeah. yeah. All right. S- somebody here we go. Uh, somebody invented algebra and right? the the equal sign or equality sign. Was invented in 1557. Wow! By Robert Record. Robert Record. Robert Record. Really? Wow. Uh, let's see. Uh, was a Welsh physi- uh, <laughs> physician and mathematician. He invented the equal sign and also introduced the pre-existing plus sign. Hmm. So he invented the plus sign and wow. equal sign. For some you- reason, I thought that symbol would would have come much earlier than that. Yeah. Maybe that's uh, just me. You know what I've been in, what I've been into lately, and it's, I've been learning a lot from. There's a podcast called Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. Mm-hmm. It's one guy, Dan Carlin, fitting, yeah. fittingly enough, and it's just him. It almost is like a college lecture. Some of these go for over two hours of him concentrating on one element of history or one incident in history, and then talking about it. He, I'm on part five of the Wrath of the Khans, and really? it's all about Genghis Khan. And even after Genghis, Genghis Khan's death, and it's so. Hold on, is it Genghis yes. Khan or is Genghis Khan? Genghis Khan or Genghis Khan? Genghis. It's Genghis. Genghis. It's not even Genghis. It's no. ge- it's Genghis. 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 So the second G is a G. Mm-hmm. The first G is a J. Genghis Khan. That's how Genghis. Dan Carlin says it. And I've been. I'm like each one of these is over an hour and a half long. So I'm what like six hours into six hours. You're going to say the if you're six hours into yeah. the Khan, you're going to call it Genghis, <laughs> Genghis Khan. Khan. Um, but it's unreal. He talks about how. Over time, Genghis Khan and what he did gets credited with like ushering in the most like the modernization and like the cleansing of the palate. Like people were stuck in their old ways in in Asia and even some of Europe. He was like mistaken as a he was mistaken for 
like a crusader for the Christians. They thought his name was like Pastor John instead of Genghis what? Khan. Yes. And so the European Christians believed that as they were fighting the Muslims, they had this 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 like savior, this ally who was on the other side of them fighting towards Europe because he was Pastor John. They didn't know that it was Genghis Khan. And eventually when he makes his way to Europe, yeah, things they, change a little <laughs> bit in their perspective. But it's a, the, he's credited. They do not know the numbers. There's almost no description of Genghis like, Khan. Ten, anywhere from 10 million to 70, 70 million people he killed. Yes. That he killed. More people in this yeah. world can be traced back to him as is their lineage than any other person yes, I've heard. So he was world. a prolific murderer and screwer. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. But it's so interesting. The first, uh, the most recent or farthest back you can go in this podcast, they talk about something called the uh, Dan Carlin is the they. It's weird, too, because sometimes you'll check out for 15 minutes, much like you would a college lecture. Sure. And then I'll be like, oh, I have to go back and listen yeah. to this. Cause it, but it's always so interesting. It talks about the sensible insanity of war, that there are things that outside of context, if you ever did them, would be insane to do. <clears throat> but in the context of war, the sense prevails of, of why you should do this. And obviously, one of the things he cites the most is the atomic bomb. That you would never do that to any sort of people in any city. But in the context of war, needing to make a decision like that can be, can be the m- most sensible thing to do. Uh, and the fact that you can argue one side or the other means that there is a logic to it. Well, it's unfortunate that one side is put in the position to make that decision mm-hmm. yeah. by the aggressor, where, yeah. where now they have to choose between 200,000 people or 1.5 million people. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's a no-win situation. It's, it's a horrible situation for the, the, the person who's retaliating to be put in. But Yeah, and they, they, they say all these things that, like, they would another crazy sensible thing was the the missile guiding system was horrible during World War II. So what they would say is, okay, we've got these, we've got guided missiles, um, but we don't want to hit people during the day when areas are most populated because we want to limit the collateral damage. So what we'll do is we'll hit those areas at night. That makes the most sense. Mm. Still an insane thing to do. Yeah. The problem is, as at night, the ability to guide these missiles just was down to almost nothing so they ended up hitting these areas anyway and it was just all of the insane sensibilities of war there's one part where they talk about in during trench warfare um men would get caught in between the trenches right and two things would happen they'd create two protocols one one protocol was to teach soldiers to shoot a man in a way that would stop him and kill him but not kill him instantly so that then he would bleed out and cry throughout the night to demoralize his comrades on the other side of the other trench and then they had to create a protocol for how to kill your own comrade who's slowly dry, dying out and like how long you wait and when you're supposed to do it and it was just it's this insane sensibility of war war is such a it's a horrific and dumb thing yeah like, like it's just so it's just so like primitive and just like but it's crazy to think about the times in which how sensibility has to work its way into insane things it's a very very interesting podcast that people should only listen to after they listen to yours yeah but uh yeah dan carlin's hardcore history Hmm. war is hell it is it It really 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 is but yeah I've, i've learned a lot um from that show just in terms of like and he cites all of his sources all yeah. the time too so mm. it, it never starts to feel like this is just one guy with a collection of newspapers yeah. <laughs> you like you like history you know, i love history. it yeah. yeah i've always w- world history yeah tell me if you what you think of this i've always thought that if i wasn't an actor and a or comedian performer doing the things that i do that's probably the only job i could have was history teacher because i'm still telling a story to to mm-hmm. a room full of people yeah i'm still i'm the one up front <laughs> And I'm going to tell you guys a story. And I, that's the way that it even intrigued me all through my and life. And then Genghis said it's Genghis. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm yeah. on that page. I, yeah? You I think would... you could teach history if you weren't acting? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, I actually have thought about going back to college to get a degree in history. I, I remember going over to uh, ex-girlfriend's. No, she was my girlfriend at the time. Her, mm-hmm. her parents' house and had a whole ton of books with me. And her mom said, why don't you just get a degree? Because I'm reading. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff that, you know... Makes me eligible for one. It's, so it's definitely um, <laughs> a, another form of storytelling. <clears throat> yeah, it's that, that yeah. very you know. Uh, the interesting thing too is that perspective of what we are when we're nineteen and twenty and going to class because mm-hmm. it feels like some sort of obligation. There is such a reward if you were to go into a class and be so 
in it, like so on the tip of that for, you know, and other people would be like, oh, yeah, we got to do that paper. And you'd be like, I'll do this it's, paper. Right on. <laughs> it's, it's I'm going to learn this thing. It's a very mixed up almost order of things. Like going to college when you're so young and you're still trying to find yourself, not knowing what you want to you know study or right. whatever. Versus as an adult now, you know, like yeah, I'm gonna go get a degree in history and I want to learn about this, mm-hmm. and you're gung ho about it. Versus like you know, oh, we got a paper coming up this weekend, but yet your friends are having a band party or something like that, and it's, right. it's a very confusing. There is uh, a part of me that thinks you should not go to college until you're 30 or over. Yeah, yeah, because it uh, it is disturbing to me that these young kids are basically. They're a captive audience. They're sitting in there. They haven't had any world experience at all. Mm -hmm. Anything the professor says, and a lot of times it's corrupt as hell, is going into their brains. And once their brains are poisoned with it, it is almost impossible to get it out of there. Absolutely. I mean, think about that. You're taking it. You're like, hey, you're young. You're You're impressionable. impressionable. You're finding out your sexuality. You know what? In fact, you're even learning how to drink. Yeah. Come, we're going to teach you all we're this shit. We're going to teach you all like, of this. We're going to teach, quote unquote, with teach. an elder or someone who you respect and you, you know, you've, you're. It's the mob mentality of these impressionable young kids mm-hmm. in a collective audience listening to this one speaker. Yeah. Even Dan Carlin you know, talks. He wrote a paper in college. Uh, I think it was later in college, but it, he was like his doctor or something like that. But he wrote a paper about the successful war tactics of the cons, like how great they were at battle, and his teacher. Gave him a lower grade because he didn't. He he said, "Well, what about all the people that they killed?" And Dan Carlin was like, "But I, I'm writing about how proficient they were at their ability to attack." And the the teacher couldn't get over the fact that he wasn't. He just how could you say this when he yeah. killed all these people? And so he gave him a lower grade. And when you're 18 or 19, you'd be like, "Oh, I guess I'm." I guess I'm not thinking I'm about not things good, the right yeah. way. And when you're older, you'll be like, no, dude, I, you, we could write a paper about the horrible people who died. I'm writing a paper about how effective they were at yeah. their tactics. Well, the horrible thing. And it's like what you were saying. It's I, like informing. I, right, and I'm going to make a presumption that that very same professor might say the, ver- say the same thing about American forces killing uh, Germans mm-hmm. or killing Japanese and, and make a moral equivalency based on numbers, based on all, all, all the people killed and not make the distinction that, well... Genghis Khan was an aggressor mm-hmm. who was a, a, an, and an oppressor and a murderer. Right. And the Americans were defending themselves. And yeah. I make that distinction. Yeah. And, 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 and so in that kid's mind now, there is no distinction between aggressive, um, a, between aggression yeah. and defending yourself. That's a great yourself. point. That yeah. is a phenomenal point. And that's why I think we get we get uh, there's a lot of confusion about that I think in 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 our world today about what is the appropriate amount of force to use how, how should we how, how should we exercise it mm-hmm. in, in other parts of the world and and in, and it plays out in people's interpretations of conflicts from Israel to Palestine to how we should deal with ISIS in Iran our notions that all force is the same and it paralyzes us morally and I think makes us very, very vulnerable. I, I've had friends. Look, I had a friend who, right after nine eleven, he was he wanted to join the military, and I said, uh, I don't recommend that, um, because you're you're going to be a part of a political process that's not going to be thinking of you as an individual or trying to hold your life as higher than the combatant that you're going to be mm-hmm. fighting. You're going to be part. You're going to be a pawn in a game that is not that you're not meant to win. Um, because we don't have that in our in our foreign policy. There's no sense of rational self-interest yeah. as a foreign policy initiative right. or distinctions of force and all those things that we've just been talking about. So I said, please don't do that, and he did. Yeah. He did. He went, and he survived. He's back with us, but uh, uh, I think I was right. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was oh, much I, more no. of like a political... It's, you know, it's it's to an extent, you know, a, a chess game of sorts where uh, to, to move your... Your piece is uncertain. You're completely fine putting, you know, pawns in certain positions that open up other positions. And it's they're not, you know, it's the they're not thinking of them as a person. It's it's the the agenda of the. And it's not even an agenda that makes a whole lot of sense. Correct. It's an agenda to democratize 
um, it, oh, but not to protect mm -hmm. uh, uh, American lives or even people in Western civilization from something savage. Yeah, yeah. it's not about making it stop. When, right. you, when you hear when you hear our diplomats saying, "Look, we want to contain this yeah. problem." Really? If you had cancer, you want to contain it, or you want to get it out of your body? Right. Yeah. Is, is it is it really immoral for you to to come out in public and say this should be? stopped like we have to we have to continue fighting until it's done not mm -hmm. not until it's limited not until it's over here in a corner somewhere where it can metastasize and become just as bad right but eliminate it yeah. unapologetically from the face of the earth because it is anti-life it's anti-human by that criteria yeah. do you would you consider the vietnam war a, a purely political war yeah yeah I, yeah i you know i i mean that those people were being moved to be doing some sort of action. Because I, I, I was watching a documentary where a Vietnam vet said, I can tell you the reason, one of the largest reasons that we lost the Vietnam War is we would take a hill, then we would move to the next hill. Whereas in World War II and World War I and the Civil War, what you were doing was pushing a line. In the Revolution War, you were pushing a line to eradicate something. So the line stayed strong and moved forward and forward and forward and forward. And you took the beach at Normandy and you would move across that trench and it would keep going. But in Vietnam, we were more just out there fighting a people to fight them. And we would take a hill, move to hill two, and then they would just come back at hill one. So now there's people behind us and there's people in front of us because we're not a unified front. Like you were saying, we we're trying to like combat something rather than remove something well and the unfortunate thing is we're allied with a very corrupt regime over there and did we have a moral right to fight somebody like ho chi Minh? yeah and i think the people in south vietnam realized that after we completely withdrew um and the re-education camps and the, the boat people doing anything they could to to emigrate from there showed us how savage that man and his ideology was but that doesn't mean we should have been there right and you're right when it, it's not it, it wasn't about protecting rights or protecting individuals protecting americans or 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 it was a, it was about democratizing a place or holding a line against a, a, a very a pervasive yeah. nationalistic movement and trying to bankrupt russia because yeah they it, were i mean i don't even think well. that was i don't even think that would have been in uh johnson's um and or uh, nixon's head at the time that, that might have been a later a, a later outgrowth of you know reagan's version yeah. of the cold war but it, it's still um it's still a disastrously rudderless policy <laughs> you know, i just and, love the analogy that you gave of like having cancer do you do you try and compartmentalize it and hold it in one place or do you say we need to get rid of it yeah yeah you don't be like it's in the arm we're just going to leave it in the arm. We're just going to leave it there. Yeah. I mean, as long as we can keep a, it in I the mean, arm. A, you might a, not have full use of that left hand, but the cancer is staying in the arm. Like, can we just get rid of the cancer? Yeah. Well, any, I think any healthy person would say that, but I think our. It's a great analogy. It's I a think, great analogy. I think our politicians and diplomats, you know, they went to Yale, Princeton, and Harvard long enough to have their common sense removed well, in, in some and, class somewhere yeah, along the line. And, if if you completely remove it, then their causes or their, you know, reelections or, or their whatever. Their jobs become obsolete if you start removing things that they have uh, plans for or policies for or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, if they have uh, um, like agendas or you know, like programs that is there, they're the strongholder of this program. They, in a sense, don't actually want it to be completely removed because then they're going to be, you know, jo jobless or. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, they definitely like you know I mean? to make themselves relevant. They you know like I mean? to say yeah. there's a crisis for which their solution is the only one exactly. possible. And that's pretty horrible. I have a question yeah. for you guys on this theme, same theme, but a different topic. I've often wondered what a negative impact it would have for the medical industry if cancer was cured. I think it would be fan it wouldn't have a negative impact on the on the can really? cancer industry. Like Mayo because Clinic and like all those doctors and all of those procedures and all those things would be all those treatments and all those people that make all that money off all that medicine and all that treatment like would go away. Well, the well because well cancer is, but it's an ever you always have can you it's always have evolving. cancer. It's an ever evolving people are disease. always getting it. And and you have cancer cells in your body right now. I have cancer cells in my body right now. So you know it's just the difference between they're, benign or malignant, right, I guess, or yeah. be, you're between your your immune system able to, able to take it out uh, or not. And, and I think it was, there would always be a market for whatever it is that they are selling that would enable us to remain healthy. Yeah. 
You know, uh, good. and, and so. industries, I like that out view look, better than the industries one I feared. fall by the wayside all the time with progress. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that we don't see many stagecoaches or horses and carriages anymore. Right. Or, or we don't see tube televisions often unless we're watching a, a period. Thing. We don't rotate. Walking down an alley. Right. Or a lot of tube televisions. The, the medical industry would have to adapt. <laughs> yeah. All adapt. You know? And maybe some of them complain because, you know, their livelihoods are there or they adapt and change and progress. I hope so. And, but there'll be some that will try to, like, you know, use the government to try to influence. Uh, you know, to gain privileges and influ- and, and remain in the market when yeah. they shouldn't, and, you know, because government seems to do that, you know, <laughs> keep people in jobs that are obsolete and keep professions alive that should be, should die. Uh, uh, but, you know, hopefully they wouldn't. Hopefully they'll, you know, they'll see that you know, it will evolve to something better. I read recently this, that, well, that was one of the biggest realizations for Steve Jobs when he was dying. He obviously chose to do some of his own things rather than listening to doctors, but the technology in hospitals blew him away in terms of how outdated it was just in terms of like how you're keeping tr- the machine you're using to keep track of my heart rate is so far outdated that that he he spoke to his colleagues and and people at apple before he passed away kind of saying like this is the next in the next 20 years the medical profession and just even the tools and instruments that they use are going that's where everything's going to start leaping and needs to like catch up well, to everything else perfect example like the the fitbit or the watch you know as as we wrap up the 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 iWatch will be able to tell your heart rate and yeah. all of that yeah and that's i mean just think of if if a watch can tell your heart rate and 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 all that right now in 10 years what type of sensors and stuff will you you'll be able to have uh, you know, like a doctor on your person at all times checking for your 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 vitals and your yeah. signs like that, and that's just. I hope so. It's hard the to future. It, it's hard to innovate when there's a regulator over your shoulder Absolutely. telling exactly. you whether or not what you're doing is appropriate or mm-hmm. in in the, in well the interest of the public good. Yeah, it is in the interest of the public good. Because yeah, it, but well, it's like I mean, they don't know that what, Tesla. Elon Musk wants to, you know, I can go into an Apple store and buy a computer from the company that's making it. They want to sell cars to the people from the people who make the car. They and also want everybody to sell the cars. I mean, they absolutely. released all their patent knowledge all the patents. to everybody. They're like, and, go ahead. We still the, think design-wise the, we'll be better than you, yeah. but go make go an electric make, car. Make the same thing and we'll make the same thing better. And the government is preventing Tesla from opening up stores in Michigan and New Jersey and all that because of lobbyists and these car dealerships who well they own be, they own GM don't they I mean Michigan's their town now yeah, isn't it yeah, like, Michigan's yeah. their state and it's yeah. like, Detroit is is in is in, it's embedded the, in Washington these regulators preventing this company from making not only selling the safest car ever to the to people but it's the I mean it's Great for the environment. I think it's it was the, the hardest, the, the highest rated car in, in consumer, like car, reports. Yeah, consumer reports in like 50 years or yeah. all time or something and like that. Like, they're having a hard time just selling it because they want to sell it directly to the consumer and not deal with all that. Well, the, thank you, focus. Mr. Regulator, for keeping me from having something I want. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Exactly. Right? Crazy. Crazy. Um, well, as we wrap up, uh, Mark, this is the time. The floor is yours. Uh, yep. Sell everything. This is anything you want to promote or talk about or tell the audience where they can find you, when they can watch you. Anything. This is this is now your show. Awesome. Um, I love that. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm on The Returned, which is on A&E, Monday nights right after Bates, uh, 10 o'clock. Check it out. But, you know, since it's cable, I think it's on sporadically throughout yeah. the day. So you can you can catch episodes one and two, you know, on, on A&E, and then uh, you'll see episode three next Monday. So be sure to check it out. I think you guys will like it. It's, it's really ramping up and getting good. Um, let's see. Also, you know, my wife is doing has done a series of international shorts that's that's um, we're, that we're compiling into a feature film, oh, and uh, we just finished principal photography on that. So hopefully, over the summer, we'll finish post and and get that out there to people. And she's also directing another movie called The Last Train, which is um, um, a, 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 a movie based on suicide prevention. That's, that's really um, really a profound movie written by a guy named Anthony Montes, who's a fine actor and a fine playwright. So. We're going to be finishing that up in the first week of April in New York. Oh, so. wonderful. Congratulations. Yeah. So yeah, thank to, you. You have to come back on and, and promote those. Oh, yeah. That would be, what about uh, that any da- any dates for Excel, the band? You guys doing anything? <laughs> uh, you know, I still, I still talk to the guitarist. We have wine every once in a while, yeah. we, you know, every other Wednesday. So I'll, I'll broach the topic to him Let's and do see Do a what show at the Virgil. <laughs> I'll be there. <laughs> the Virgil would be, that'd be fun. Yeah, that'd be an that'd amazing be, venue be for it. Uh, where can they, are you on Twitter? Are you on 
Yes, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. It's uh, Marco Pellegrino at Marco Pellegrino. Uh, Follow me, and uh, and every once in a while, I like to open up a can of worms. Uh, which people who follow me knows what that is. I throw out a topic that's controversial, and I know it's going to really piss people off or get like them it. agitated, and and then we get into we, it. We tweet debate for about a week over it, and uh, I don't know if I win or lose those things, but I, I just like people being in on the conversation. Yeah. That's they, great. He doesn't know if he wins, but the next, the next, uh, the next week they're tweeting, "Holy cow, the return is so good!" <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so they still come back. They do uh, come back. Dan, what do you got? Oh, you can follow me at Daniel Van Kirk. Check out my podcast, Hindsight, on the Steve Dahl Network. And then I also do the podcast, Sclarborough County, with the Sklar Brothers. Yeah. And uh, other than that, oh, I do a character show. Uh, hold on. Uh, sorry. Every... Someone's at the door. Hang on. God oh, damn it. it. I've been, th- I'm sorry, guys. Sorry to interrupt here. He's been, hey. he's been, he's been. Hey, guys, don't. This guy, God? God damn it, Mark. Hey. Yeah, Ladies t- and gentlemen, I... Mark Wahlberg. Hey, yeah, I wanted to promote my show. I do a show. It's the second Tuesday of every month at UCB here in town. And then we also we also do that on the year with Mark. I'd love to have you come by, dude. You, sure. Just a couple of marks shooting the topics. I love it's your basically, work, man. Oh, thank you, dude. Yeah. I love your work too. Oh, thanks. Whoa. Uh, uh, awesome. No, what I was going to say was what we do is a show. It's kind of like politically incorrect if it was better. Like I host it. You're right on. And we just have people on talking about topics and we fix this fucking world, man. I love that. Yeah, man, dude. Man. And so that's on the Earwolf Network. It's called yeah. the Wahlberg Solution. The Wahlberg Solution. Of course. Man, how do you find time to everything? You got the Wahlberg Solution. You got that burger joint. Yep, I'm that blowing up shit show? with Michael Bay sometimes. Man. Yeah, dude. I, did you see Transformers? I did see Transformers. Fucking best before, documentary man. of the year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited that those robot dinosaurs were real. Oh, yeah. Dude, we fucking dude. killed those motherfuckers, dude. I told him, I'm like, we don't even need the guns. I'll just fight them. There's like, Optimus Prime was like, no, no, no. We'll fucking shoot them. So that's what we did. But yeah, check out that show. I'm going to roll out. Is that cool? Yeah, absolutely. Take All right. Hey, take right. Mark, I'm dead serious. All Let's right. fucking do something. You together. got it. Thanks, Mark. All right. Thanks, Mark. See you later. That was nice. That was oh, great. Man. That was so that good was for him great. to stop by. Yeah, so I think great. it was between workouts. Yeah, yeah. He, I, I, I walked I mean, by him when he was carrying a weight when he walked in. Here. He said he was getting back to that seventy k. He's running oh, a seventy k. Wow. I guess I don't know how he's he does it. Uh, yeah, so that show is the that's the Wahlberg solution that Mark was telling you about. That's at Earwolf every other month, and then look for uh, look. For, I did a Comedy Central pilot. Hopefully that'll get picked up. Good for you. Called Just Saying, and we'll find yeah. out in a couple of months. We just turned that in, and then. The show on PBS, yeah, yeah, which facilitated me having something to contribute to this show. Hopefully, and I like it. I yeah, like it. and that—that that is called it. "You're Doing It Wrong." You're doing it wrong. Yeah, and that'll on... be a, on PBS dot com. I think. Okay. Yeah, I like it. Wonderful. Love it. Wonderful. So everybody, do those things. And then, uh, as usual, give us a good review on iTunes and tell Please. your friends to listen to us. And you're continuing to do that, and, and we love it, and we appreciate everybody. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter at my name is Razzle Two. You can follow Dan Casey, who's not here, at Osteo Ferocious. You can like us on Facebook. Today we learned with Razzle or Dan. Send us an email uh, if you have a fact or trivia or anything like that. Uh, today we learned podcast at gmail dot com. And uh, we just uh, we want to appreciate Mark and Dan for being here, and we appreciate it. Thank you, man. And everybody, man. everybody, great. watch the show, watch the returned, and uh, you know, as for every, uh, as always, thanks for everything, Julie Newmar. So uh, <laughs> thanks, guys. Thank you, Julie. Let's see you, thanks. Buddy. Thanks, man. Now leaving nerdist.com. dot <laughs>